What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I want to introduce my wonderful co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. Hey, ladies, yes. how y'all doing? Hi. Good to see you guys. It's, Feeling it's good about at least being able to be online up for a bit today and that we are all kind of warm enough yeah. and Absolutely. have what we need. I know well, many are struggling right now. Absolutely. And I'm glad you guys can't smell me right now because uh, <laughs> my, my, my pipes have frozen and, and I've been having to take field showers. So I got a canteen cup and some water and I hit some hot spots and then I'm ready, <laughs> ready for chief check because you know, right there with you, chief, right there with you. <laughs> Texas is, is not ready for this cold weather. So, uh, you know, my prayers and, and, and everything else going out to all the folks that don't have electricity out there. Uh, it's cold out there. So just, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep them in our prayers. But uh, today we have an outstanding guest who Chief Toberman refers to as the OG, original guardian. So, and she's going to fill us <laughs> in with all things Space Force. Without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Hey, thanks, Chief. We are truly honored to host today's guest. She entered the Air Force in 1991. Now she serves as Commander, Combined Force Space Component Command, U.S. Space Command, and Deputy Commander, Space Operations Command, U.S. Space Force. She leads more than 17,000 joint and combined personnel to plan, integrate, conduct, and assess global space operations to deliver combat-relevant space capabilities to combatant commanders, coalition partners, the joint force, and our nation. Please help us welcome Major General Deanna Burt. Hey. Awesome. Thanks. It's awesome to be here on Chief's Chat today. So thanks for inviting me. It's wonderful. General Burt, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. I know everybody appreciates it. And our housekeeping for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. Share your comments and questions with Major General Burt. We'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now is a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page, you should because Chief Chats are every week and following us helps you know who's coming up next. Awesome. So Major General Bird, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's great to see you again. For those that don't know, I met uh, Major General Bird at the Armed Forces Bowl here in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, I think it was New Year's Eve or, or yeah, it was New Year's Eve. And um, I can tell you what, she is super, super excited about the Space Force. And she's super, super excited about the exchange. So she gave us a whole bunch of ideas for merch. So we're going to put her on, on our merchandising team uh, once she decides to retire, man, because she, she got some awesome <laughs> ideas to get the, get the Space Force out there. Uh, so ma'am, can you tell us where you're joining us from today? Uh, I am much warmer than you, Chief. Sorry. Uh, I am joining you from the Central Coast here at Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, in California. Uh, here in my office at the Combined Forces Space Component Command. Excellent. And to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you become interested in the military and then decide on a life of service? Uh, so I am uh, from the great state of Kentucky originally. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. My parents, uh, we moved to Florida when I was in about the sixth grade. Uh, so I was right there uh, during uh, the prime shuttle time. So I became a Space Coast baby and really got interested uh, in the space program uh, growing up. Uh, I came up in a blue collar family, really couldn't afford to send me to college. I mean, my parents made very clear grades uh, and things were going to be important if I wanted to go to college. I was the first person in my family to go to college uh, at the, with the help of the United States Air Force and an ROTC scholarship. Uh, so that was great. I mean, I was really uh, athletic, but I wasn't Michael Jordan at anything. And I was uh, <laughs> decent in school, took a lot of AP classes, but I was not a Rhodes Scholar. So uh, the military and an ROTC scholarship seemed to be the way that I came into the Air Force uh, on a scholarship in 1987 is when I graduated from high school and entered college. Uh, and so in the 80s is when you may remember in 1980 was the first year that women entered the U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, Lieutenant General Helms retired as one of those first 80s ladies. So in the 1980s in general, they were trying to recruit and boost women in the Air Force overall. Um, <clears throat> and it's a testament. I, when I came in the Air Force in 1987, there were only 12% of women uh, in the Air Force. Uh, and today there's about 22% uh, of the Air Force is made up, officers is made up of women. So 
uh, impressive. But I got my engineering degree at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, and then entered active duty. I always wanted to be a space operator, so came into space operations. So I've been in the Air Force uh, for 28 years now, and now uh, hoping to transfer into the Space Force here shortly. Uh, but I uh, have been a space operator my entire career and have loved every minute of it. Uh, and it's really an exciting time, uh, as Chief mentioned, to be a space operator as we stand up, not only a combatant command, uh, but a service. Uh, and I would say the reason I stayed, you know, I went in for school for four years, took my scholarship. I really thought I was going to do four years and done, um, pay my commitment back for the school money and, and leave. But I fell in love with it. I mean, the people, the mission, uh, the things that we do are just so exciting. Uh, and the <clears throat> the amount of responsibility and, and what the Air Force allows me to do and now the Space Force uh, every day in this job is really, really exciting uh, compared to what I could be doing on the outside. And so to defend this great nation and to be a part of service to it uh, has just been an honor and a privilege uh, and I really enjoy it. Awesome. And so you mentioned about, you know, the the, the combatant command piece of it and, and a completely different force. And uh, when we introduce you, you have two duty titles. And so, uh, and it looks like you got one foot in the, the, the combatant command side and the other foot in the actual Space Force side. So can you can you explain why you have two uh, duty titles? Absolutely. On the chief on the joint side under U.S. Space Command, I'm the Combined Forces Space Component Command Commander. So uh, in that hat, my job is really to run uh, the Space Operations Center uh, or what is the equivalent to our Air Operations Center. So if you were to go downrange into CENTCOM and you see their AOC, our Space Operations Center is here at Vandenberg and it's called the Combined uh, Forces or com the Combined Space Operations Center. So we have both coalition and commercial partners uh, here uh, on the ops floor day in and day out. Um, so it's a great operation and it brings space capabilities to the combat edge. We've been doing that in the Space Operations Center here, the CSPOC, uh, since the early 2000s, uh, supporting theaters downrange. Uh, this has now just become part of the Unified Combatant Command as we stood it up uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, it'll be two years in August of 19, uh, to build and bring those space capabilities and how do we integrate with the warfighters downrange uh, and provide space effects in order to fight and win our nation's wars uh, in a multi-domain fight. So that's the joint side, more operations. Uh, on the service side, I am the deputy to the Space Operations Command, which is really the organized training equip arm of the Space Force supporting operations. So when you think about our Space Operations Center here, the core of that, just like in an Air Operations Center, <clears throat> is the Space Force. So we have a Space Force core that is our uh, Space Operations Center that's then built around with joint billets to become a joint and combined uh, organization, very similar to uh, the CAOC out in CENTCOM, where you have a, an Air Force core that is the AOC core, and then it's built up uh, with coalition partners and joint partners there to be the CFAC and that combined operation. So very similar on the space side in that you have uh, my joint hat, which is the actual operation that reports to US Space Command, similar to how the CAOC reports to CENTCOM, but then you also have the service component. I, as the deputy SPOC, uh, working through General Whiting, who is the SPOC commander, to do that organized training equip. How do we best put the people, the resources, uh, and systems in support of that operation. So uh, again, very similar parallels of service versus joint uh, when you look at the operations center. Absolutely. Wow. And you mentioned earlier that you've been interested in space for a really long time. Um, and it, it seems space has heavily influenced your career. So what was the transition like from Air Force to space and how did how did that come to be? Well, so I think what's been, uh, you know, I think it's really, some people really think like, oh, we, we, we have Air Force roots, just like the Air Force has Army roots, right? The Army Air Corps was what started the Air Force. So this is no different when we talk about uh, the Space Force. Our roots are in the Air Force. Uh, again, I've been a 28-year space operator uh, in the Air Force. I'm hoping to sw switch over and wear my blue tapes uh, here in the next few months. Uh, for general officers, we have to go through a Senate confirmation. The White House has to nominate us and we have to be confirmed uh, through the Senate in order to cross over into the Space Force. So there's a few of us at the GO level that were awaiting boards or recently promoted that are, are waiting to make that transition. Uh, but as far as, as going from why I joined the Air Force <clears throat> at the time in the 80s, I mean, again, I have said all along, the Air Force and the Space Force are the brain forces. We are the guys, uh, we, we definitely value education. Uh, we look at technology. We are very lean forward in innovation. 
Uh, and it was the service that just excited me as a woman. It wasn't about the physicality. It was about how do I use my brain in a way to help defend the nation and, and to serve. Um, and it, I felt it was the best match for me. I mean, I was the first in my family uh, to join the Air Force. So it, it just matched for me uh, from a perspective of where I wanted to be. I also grew up on the Space Coast. So again, was there for the whole shuttle program, watched those launches uh, going through school uh, and was excited about space and where we were going uh, with all of that uh, down at NASA. So to me, when offered what would I like to do in the Space Force, they offered, or the Air Force, they offered me a scholarship and I had to take a uh, STEM degree. Uh, so I have an aeronautical engineering undergraduate. So uh, it just seemed natural to go into a STEM related job, which is what they were paying me to do, which is was in the, within space within the Air Force. Uh, so I've grown up uh, post, I came in just post Desert Storm in 1991, which we call our first space war, uh, if you will, and how we use space capability. So from the very beginning of my career all the way through, I've known nothing but integration and how we take space and put it with the other domains uh, to fight and win our nation's war. So I, I've gone to weapons school, I've done SAS. Every school that I've done over the course of my career has been about how do we integrate space into the fight. Uh, so it's been very different um, than most. And so the war fighting focus, the getting after where we were going, we've now seen the enemy recognize how important space is to us, our American way of life and our American way of war. And now they are coming to contest us in the domain. So how do we make sure that we can protect the satellites that all of the other uh, joint partners depend on as well as our coalition and commercial partners have assets and resources there that also need to be defended. So that, that makes the shift into going from a, a, a supporting to the other components and combatant commands to now there's a case here to be made that space could be a supported command, which is why we stood up the combatant command. And then in order to support that combatant commander, you need the people that are trained and the systems that are solely focused to fight and win in a contested domain which drives a need for a separate service that's totally focused on building those systems. Um, so it's definitely changed. Uh, the Space Force is, is rooted with our Air Force roots, uh, but with a clean slate approach and standing up a new service in the middle of the digital age, I think you're gonna see uh, there are very much differences in flattening the organization and empowering the lowest level uh, and driving innovation and, and a more digital focus uh, than you've seen in the past. Uh, with the other services that frankly were born uh, and have uh, evolved over the industrial age. Absolutely, and, and you mentioned uh, uh, building a new service in the digital age. So, um, you know, I've been I've been following uh, the Space Force since it started, uh, and I like to call it 14 months old because it's not old enough to to be called years, right? Because like <laughs> like ki like when you have kids, you right. say they're 18 months and until they, I guess two is two the magic number where you stop calling <laughs> you know, counting them by months. But uh, so so you. Doing it during a digital age is one thing, but doing it during a pandemic is a completely different thing. So can you uh, kind of tell us how that's been or the challenges of uh, building a new service during a pandemic? I think for everyone, I mean, we've all faced this, uh, is how do you talk to people who are geographically separated? As a Space Force, we fight from our installations. We're employed in place. So we've always been geographically separated around the globe, and we've had to find ways to communicate with each other. What we had to do, though, was increase the amount of bandwidth that we had in the Air Force, quite frankly, the whole DOD, uh, these Zoom meetings. We would have never done Zoom in the past or uh, some of the capabilities we brought on from the commercial arena to give us more bandwidth to interact at a personal level um, as much as we can. Phone calls are great, but you can't see. Uh, you can see I talk with my hands. Uh, I have more facial expressions, things. It's really hard when you're just doing email and phone calls to really understand uh, and make that personal connection. And that's what's been really tough in COVID is, is making and building relationships with people, especially new partners here. We have uh, coalition partners, we have uh, commercial partners. And again, not doing those face-to-faces and visits and going out and sharing a meal and getting to know uh, the people that you're working with and, and around the globe has made it very hard. But we've tried to pick that up with more digital engagements like Zoom uh, more meetings, uh, finding greater capabilities. It's actually been a benefit when it comes to the coalition. We have a system called BICES that we use at the classified level to be able to talk to our coalition partners. Uh, in the past, that network has not been uh, very reliable and we've not had as many terminals over the course of the pandemic that has increased and that bandwidth has improved. So there's been some goodness come out of this. I think once uh, we get past everyone getting vaccinated and things kind of get back to where we can travel more, uh, I think that's going to be the first thing we need to do is to continue to build uh, and interact and build those relationships because that's the, the human to human connection or as uh, Chief Toberman likes to say, analog leadership. 
we've been doing a lot of digital leadership. <laughs> How do we get to that analog leadership uh, of engaging with each other uh, more, but it, it's been great. We are connected. Uh, we've been able to really focus on digital and how do we flatten an organization and power the lowest level because uh, we couldn't frankly meet uh, and get together as often as we normally would. Uh, we've also just simplified uh, working through how we coordinate documentation and making sure we're only having the people who absolutely need to look at something coordinate. Uh, we've eliminated, I don't know if you guys are tracking, when you compare the Air Force structure to the Space Force structure, we eliminated uh, two levels of bureaucracy. So there is no more numbered Air Force and there is no ops group within the Space Force structure. So it's a flattened organization. You go from the squadron to what we call a Delta or garrison, which is a wing or air base wing equivalent, uh, directly to the field command, which is a MAGCOM equivalent and directly then to the CSO staff uh, in DC. So uh, that flattening has allowed innovation and a lot of great things to occur um, and in a pandemic, I think it has driven people to think differently how to solve problems. So that, that sense of innovation and wanting to do things differently uh, has absolutely taken root because we've had to work around uh, the issue to get it done. So uh, it changes the way we do operations, but it has not changed our ability to deliver operations. And we continue to do that day in and day out. Yeah, I, th I think um, I want to say Mountain Home did some type of uh, pilot on kind of flattening the organization to uh, to. To, to the effect of, and, I, and, it's, and it's cool that you guys uh, have such a small organization in the Space Force to be able to able to execute on a lot of things that uh, the bigger services is gonna take a while before it can, you know, be a thing. So so I think that's cool that y'all are taking advantage of-, of oh, I, I agree, Chief, that is exactly true. Mountain Home uh, it had done that organization and General Holmes and General Raymond talked quite a bit as we came into standing up the Space Force and General Holmes recommended that to General Raymond as well. So. There's been a lot of uh, cross flow between the services of what would we, if we could start clean slate, you know, at the four star level, they've had a lot of conversations. If you could start clean slate, what would you do differently? And you're right, we're small. Uh, so light, lean and lethal, we're only gonna be 16,000 strong and end game. So not a large service at all. Uh, and so is there a way to do things at a smaller scale and try and work those um, DevSecOps opportunities where you, you iterate on problems and you try something, if you fail, hey, fine, you move on to the next thing and you keep iterating. Uh, and then once we find something that works, how do you then upscale that to the rest of, of the Department of the Air Force, uh, if the Department of the Air Force chooses to use it uh, for the Air Force so or the other services? So I think there's a lot of benefit of the Space Force can provide to the other services uh, to help them move faster uh, and at, at lower cost, frankly, because if you do it at a small scale and you work out all the kinks, when you upscale it to the larger uh, services, uh, I think that saves them money and time and they can take it on quicker. Absolutely. Light, lean and lethal. Ma'am, you've had an incredible career. You could be considered an inspiration to young women. What would you like our future military leaders, especially women to know about making the military career, particularly in space? I think, as I said earlier, I think the Space Force is about being the brain force and we value it's a meritocracy like any service. It's about performance. Uh, if I could go back and talk to my college self, it would be to to not be to be bold, to, to step out and not be afraid. There's a lot of opportunity uh, in all of our services. Uh, and again, the opportunities that women have today as compared to when I entered uh, in 1991 are, are very different. And, and we've almost doubled the percentage of women in the military uh, in those years. We still got work to do. Uh, to match the, you know, the U.S. population is the diversity and inclusion we would like to see uh, in the Space Force, and that's been a priority for us. So uh, again, the Space Force is looking for, we're, there's a ton of competition to come in. We are holding boards uh, and interviewing folks to come in, and we're looking to create that diversity and inclusion from the ground floor and new people in the sessions that come into the service. Uh, so that's great. So I think there's lots of opportunity uh, for women and for anyone uh, of a diversity background to be there. Because again, to be a digital service and to be innovative and clean slate and move out, you need diversity of thought. You need people from different backgrounds, uh, races, ethnicities, religions, uh, genders, you name it. We've got to have it all if we're really going to tackle this with an open mind and to make change at scale that we need to make. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for women in the United States Space Force and we value diversity. Uh, and I would say, uh, the biggest piece is getting after those degrees, getting after performance and getting in uh, to the service, whether that be through, you know, traditional uh, basic military training. We still use that for the Space Force, uh, as well as officer training school, OTS. We use both of those still today, and well as the U.S. Air Force Academy and ROTC. But we've definitely honed in on particular schools that are STEM related. 
uh, for ROTC as well as OTS uh, and looking for those. Uh, and then BMT now has a, a portion of the course that is very space focused and they get some additional space training as guardians when they go through BMT and OTS uh, coming into the service. So I think there's a lot of growth, but it, it's a great place to be. Um, I've learned a ton, I've had great mentors uh, and I've had people who have believed in me and pushed me along. And, and I think that's only gonna continue to grow as we stand up the Space Force. Well, well ma'am, I, I can tell you, you got you got one one woman that's super excited, ready, willing, and able to, to join the Air Force. And that's our very own Leah Matthews. She, <laughs> she absolutely <laughs> loves the Space Force. I do. I do love the space. Yeah, but I would miss you on Chief Chat. So you got to weigh that. <laughs> awesome. So, um, so we talked about, you know, building a force during the, the pandemic. Uh, so let's kind of focus on you. Like, how, how have you been able to stay grounded during the pandemic? And, um, and what advice would you have for people? Because uh, I, I know we talked about Chief Toberman before we started, and he's the the, the fish whisperer, right? And so, you know, he, he finds his zen and himself uh, and his resiliency uh, out there, you know, in the water, you know, casting the, casting the reel. So uh, how do you stay grounded? And what advice would you uh, give to young young guardians and air, or airmen or just any service member during these hard times? Uh, yeah, I, I, Chief, that's a great question. I, I think I'm a creature of habit. And so when the pandemic started uh, and the things that I really enjoy to do, I'm a huge Orange Theory uh, attendee and I love Orange Theory. I love going to the gym and being with folks at 5 a.m. in the morning and doing a great workout with folks and just interacting with people who may not even be in the military. It was a lot of teachers and doctors uh, who are in class in the morning when we were in Colorado. But due to the pandemic, you know, gyms started to close. Uh, we couldn't go to those. And so I was kind of at a loss. Like I had some equipment, I have a treadmill and some stuff in my house. but that human connection and interaction that I got every day out of going to the gym and interacting was really hard to replace. Um, in November, I was blessed. Uh, I bought a, a Peloton and I was kind of leery about was the digital thing uh, gonna fill the gap, but it absolutely does. You get on that bike and people start high-fiving you digitally and you're racing and you're doing it in real time. I, I just love that bike. Uh, it is it is actually saving me. I'm running outside, you know, again, during the summer wasn't bad, but. Uh, and doing things outside was great, but really that human interaction, the gyms are opening up. We're uh, doing, I go to Santa Barbara to still go to Orange Theory once a week. And um, I have religiously gone there every Saturday morning, but you're wearing masks, we're outside. Um, we wear masks as we move around, but when we're on our stations, we can be outside and not have it on. But, and it's great because the weather here allows that. Oh, yeah. um, but that, that's the thing I would say is the routine of what do you do and how do you modify it in the pandemic is really hard. And if what you love to do shut totally down, how do you make up for that um, in another way? Um, and so getting into a battle rhythm, uh, I know a lot of folks are eating, uh, trying to eat well uh, has been a priority for me as well because it's really simple when you're home teleworking a lot in the beginning was to eat terribly, uh, drink a whole lot more uh, wine and other things and just to get really unhealthy fast. And I think that was my goal was to try not to, to do that. So I would just say get in a battle rhythm, find something to, to keep you busy working, um, working on hobbies or other things that you like to do. Uh, I got into, it'll sound really silly, but paint by numbers just because it was a mindless oh. thing I could do and, and do something artistically. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you just find what is your, <clears throat> what is your thing. Um, but having a battle rhythm and a purpose to get up every day and you know, having a, a routine where you take a shower, even though you're teleworking and you get dressed and you do things, I think it's just the, the discipline to do that because it's very easy without that to fall back into, you know, letting yourself go, eating bad stuff, being depressed. Uh, it just, it, it compounds on itself. So how do you, how do you best do that? I have also spent a lot more time. Uh, I probably have talked to more friends uh, in during this pandemic and stayed more connected with family than I have in the past as well. Mm. Uh, just because I have the time and we're calling people and the Zoom stuff, we started doing Zoom happy hours and Zoom functions with each other uh, to get together. And so I think it's been great that people have found creative ways to still connect, even though we can't uh, see each other in person. Um, and it's that seeing someone's facial expressions and, and all of that. And then, of course, uh, the whole Facebook and the interacting with each other on social media. Uh, again, it's been a little tough. Elections were tough. And some of those things were... Uh, can get a little crazy, but uh, you know, those are the people that I unfriend and I spend my time talking to the folks who are uplifting <laughs> to me uh, and they're posting workout stuff, which makes me feel guilty if I don't go to the gym. And so, uh, yeah, 
picking and choosing friends on social media for a problem, I think is really important. I think some people uh, got sucked into some of the negativity and I just, I just simply unfriended or unfollowed those folks and stayed focused on uh, th those people that lifted me up rather than those that were tearing me down. I oh, know that that was advice. Gr great advice. A absolutely great advice. I picked up on a couple of things, Orange Theory. So I have a friend out there, a ma retired math sergeant, Kerry Carr. He's a Orange Theory instructor and he's out there getting it all the time. So <laughs> I, I never, I've never done Orange Theory, but I'm, I'm kind of curious now to, to, to kind of try it out once, once, once life becomes a little bit more normal. Uh, but, and, and, I, and I absolutely need a support system when I'm working out, like working out at home is just, <laughs> it, it, I just, not I, the same. I can't get with it. <laughs> I can't. I, well, and that's what, you know, Chief, I agree. I, I like the other people when you're in Orange Theory, you're competing against yourself. You do various challenges and there are, are, you know, PRs that you're working for, but Peloton does the same thing. I mean, you're earning badges, you get things and, and you're, um, you know, from workout to workout what your PR is. And when you're riding, I, the thing that was most interesting to me when I first got on the bike was every time you ride, let's say you do 30 minute rides is the distance you like to do. It will show you what your PR is for a 30 minute ride. And that bar will go up and down based on where you are in the workout. So you're racing yourself okay, yeah. every time you get on the bike. Of, is it a PR day or am I feeling it? Or am I just going to be about what my normal is for a 30 minute workout? So it holds you accountable um, and it's really great. And then to be in live classes with the instructor uh, and they're calling out how many classes people have completed. And you're hearing people that have done like 2000 of these classes or 2000 rides. Oh you're like, wow. Yeah. Um, wow. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and, it, and it definitely gives me something to strive for. It's funny, the things we will do for a t-shirt or a badge, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or, thing, uh, where, you know, we're grown adults, but those things are exciting. And, and, but I, it is, it's, it's very much speaks to your competitive spirit and heart and, and how do you make yourself a better person? And so, like I said, I, Peloton is the closest thing I've been able to come to that uh, matches orange theory in a virtual setting. And I'm sure there are others out there, but uh, that's the one that's, that's worked for me. And, and also just one last thing uh, you, you, you mentioned about uh, protecting your energy or protecting your positive spirit, right? And so uh, that, that's just, a, I just wanna piggyback, which no one, everybody hates the guy that piggybacks on, on somebody else's, but I just, I just wanna definitely say that uh, protecting your energy is, is super, super important. And if, if people aren't positive, then you just maybe need to distance yourself. So uh, thank you for that, for that sound advice for our viewers. But I think people feel a chief, a, a responsibility that, okay, if we were friends on Facebook, for example, and I'm on the old stuff, I don't do, I'm not a tweeter or any of the other stuff. Facebook. No is TikTok, really ma'am. You're not TikToking. If, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Same. The videos that people post on Facebook, but I am not a TikToker. Um, the fun that, the part that's fun though is, uh, you know, especially as we go through certain things and you see these people that just keep posting negative things. Um, I think people feel guilty to unfriend someone. So I will just unfollow someone for 30 days. So I just don't see them for 30 days. And if 30 days I come back and they come back on and they're still as negative Nellie's will, then I just say, okay, maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm following you forever. Um, and I don't like to do that. Uh, but at the same time, it's, you know, making yourself a priority and not letting other people suck you into their drama or their negativity. And that, and that's hard because again, you want to be able to be there for other people, but I think there's a limit. You got to set boundaries of your own or you're going to hurt yourself in the end. Absolutely. Ma'am, the exchange is excited to serve guardians. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of the exchange benefit and maybe share a time the exchange was there for you during your career? I know when we met you at the Armed Forces Bowl, you even knew um, some associates who were in Colorado Springs. You knew them by name. You, I, you know, you shared stories about how they still let you know when there's new Space Force <laughs> merchandise uh, coming into oh, yeah. the store. Uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about your experience with the exchange? No, I think the exchange is, uh, has been throughout my career, the place you go, it's the end all be all for uniform wear for things. Uh, and it's very convenient when you live on, and, and even more so now that I live on base all the time, um, it's just super convenient. And in, in the pandemic, it's been amazing because again, I feel safer going there than I do going off base, uh, the protocols and the rule sets. Uh, so again, I think AFIS has done a great job as well in the pandemic and how you've handled it. Uh, and so I feel much safer going on base and shopping than I do uh, going off base. So uh, kudos to the entire AFIS team and, and all the things that you've done across the board. Um, I agree. Um, 
Jackie Arms was my favorite lady at Peterson Air Force Base in the comms, in the uh, clothing sales. Uh, and, and those folks are great because they knew how much we all love Space Force stuff. And as the new Space Force things were coming out, the blue tapes, the patches, the various things, Jackie would send me, note, hey, we have whatever. Uh, and she would laugh at me because she would put some stuff aside and I would literally the same day come over and buy it. And I'm like, okay, I want stock in this particular clothing sales because I'm here like every other day as you get new stuff. Um, and Jackie, and we, and it flies off the shelf. I'm now at Vandenberg and I've met the ladies here and they're just as amazing, but the, it flies off the shelf. So chief, you're going to laugh. Guess what was in the BX here at uh, Vandenberg? What's that? It was a raccoon in a U.S. Space Force, on a, on a U.S. Space Force t-shirt. It was a raccoon. It was a guardian. Oh, did you have something to do with that, <laughs> ma'am? It was Cause... kind of like Korea. It was kind of like Korea and not quite the character from Guardians of the Galaxy, but it was a <laughs> raccoon. It was really cool. <laughs> so it, it's funny you say that because we, we had Chief Toverman on, on the show and, um, and I, our, we we sold out, right, Leah? We did we sell out yes, the place for yes. merchandise? Like we weren't even ready for the demand uh, on online, and so uh, we, we we called ahead before your interview. Be like, listen, we got Major General Burke coming on and see Space Force, so make sure you get <laughs> we get this inventory right uh, for for the folks that are going out for the, the Space Force merch. I have literally bought many an Air Force swag thing for my family members over the years. Uh, my stepson, same thing. I I bought swag things, and and they they're like, oh yeah, thanks. I this you know the last this past year I bought a bunch of Space Force swag, and my I got my stepson a hoodie, and he was like, like it was the greatest thing I ever bought him. Um, <laughs> and I just made, and I was like, wow, okay. Everybody was like, oh hey, did you got any more of that space Space Force swag stuff? T-shirts, shirts. Uh, both my my husband retired, and then of course I PCS, so we we bought a lot of gifts. Uh, this past fall and yeah everybody wanted space force gear and they didn't care what it was it could be a mug it could be a coin it could be a shirt they but they were just ecstatic to get anything with space force on it so <laughs> yeah you guys should be milking that for as much as you can right now that's so cool <laughs> i have been trying to get a shirt from from us because i i feel guilty if i don't buy it from the exchange uh since our chief toberman interview and literally i still don't have a space force shirt so Hopefully soon. I find one. I will be it. I will make it a priority to find you a space force shirt. What is your size? <laughs> oh ma'am. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> no, we're gonna find you a space force shirt. We're gonna get you one. I need you to be a space force wearing. If you want to be in the space force, we gotta at least get you a shirt. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. All right. I'll share my size. Not on not on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was a huge foul as a woman. I should have never asked you your size on. on the yeah, you're fine. Oh my gosh. Um, Ma'am, we want to turn to our live feed and share some of the comments that we're receiving. Um, you're getting a great reception. We have people watching from all over. So we have Burgundy Bordeaux who says, sign me up. I'm prior service and I need a break from land wars for me, plus you overseas. So for all of the, um, so all of your brain in space for a change, Hua. So Burgundy, she wants to come join the Space Force, um, which is pretty cool. So Burgundy, and, we're working, it sounds like Burgundy's in the Army. Is that what she said? It seems like she had been in the Army at one point um, and wants to, wants to come back to serve. Okay, great. Now there are, right now we're working through the inner service transfer pieces. So I think you guys are all tracking that are online that we did within the Air Force. There were certain Air Force specialty codes. So think space operations, 13 Sierras, one Charlie sixes, uh, your Intel acquisition and cyber, both officer enlisted AFSCs uh, just came over here in this month of February. We've been doing those transfers uh, as we speak. So uh, I think we, we stayed inside the Air Force, but uh, General Raymond and the team are working very hard on now the inner service transfers from the other services. And what are the opportunities? Uh, many may not know, you can always transfer. Uh, there's always a process to transfer from one service to another. During desert or during uh, OEF and OIF, there was a blue to green process where you could transfer to the army uh, because the army with all the work we had going on in CENTCOM needed help. So uh, there's always opportunities at different times uh, to transfer from one service to another. And we're working now to solidify, General Raymond and the team are working that uh, with our S1, with the rest of the one community across the services and the Department of Defense of how to make that transfer uh, from different services. So I expect there will be some announcements on that 
uh, here in the next few months, but uh, absolutely Burgundy, uh, there's a way to compete and come back, absolutely. Very, that's very exciting. Um, I also wanted to share Jim Moore. He says, although I'm retired now, this keeps me up to date. Thank you. So he's thanking you for um, hanging out with us and sharing some knowledge. We have one question from Brian Hyatt. He says, General, do you see things such as Zoom meetings, teleworking, and virtual PME? Do you think that will stick around for a while? Yeah, I think it'll stick around for a while. And I think we found ways to reach more folks. So uh, we definitely want to get back to some in-person, as I mentioned, that analog leadership where we're together and relationship building. But I think what we don't want to see is us regress in these capabilities because we've created this great uh, comm architecture uh, to meet and get together with larger groups of folks. Uh, so we want to keep that. So I, I would absolutely, we need to keep using it in order to keep it and get it funded. Uh, but we will go back uh, to more in-person as well. So I think it's going to be a mix of that. I, I will tell you fr quite frankly, there are people who work for me today who are absolutely more productive at home than they are here. <laughs> and you might go, what? But it, it's really about, so if you're someone who has to write a lot of documents, like my CAG, my Commander's Action Group, they do a lot of speech writing and a lot of document reviewing uh, and building those things. Well, when people are knocking on your door and phones are ringing and people are bugging you, that, that's really hard to stay focused. When you can be in a quiet place and no one's bothering you and you can crank something out paperwork wise. Um, so there's some people who actually have been much more productive at home. So again, I think this telework and using telework as part of our normal work week uh, is going to continue because it gives you an opportunity uh, to really dig into documentation and read uh, and take some white space to, to look at some things that again, in the past we've, we've pushed through pretty hard. So I think it's been very valuable uh, and, and we're going to find with the workforce, there are people who really uh, do better work in this environment of being work, teleworking than they are in person. And we're just going to have to work the position descriptions and the job titles uh, to make that match so that it's legal and, and we don't have any concerns there. That's great insight. I want to share uh, one final comment too with you. It's from Kim Brooks. She says, glad that there was a lot of crosstalk with other services, IOT, stand up the light, lean and lethal space force. Hashtag brain force, hashtag HUA. <laughs> awesome. You create a lot of hashtags, man. Oh, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things. I mean, across all the services, I think sometimes, um, you know, people believe we threw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, there's there's a lot of things. And if you look at the Air Force today, there's still uh, remnants of things that when we were in the Army Air Corps, I mean, there, there, there's history there. That's not going to go away. But it's how do you take the best of, of all and, and come forward uh, in a small force? And, and absolutely to be as small as we are requires us to be digitally focused because we won't have the manpower to do all the jobs. So how do you focus uh, your manpower, your military manpower on the things that are important and you digitize or automate uh, or use artificial intelligence for the things that are the day-to-day -day grind uh, that you don't necessarily have to have a human in the loop. Uh, so I think there's there's going to be a, a lot of learning here. I know all the services care about becoming digital and, and entering the information age. This isn't just a Space Force thing. So again, I'm hoping we can learn and make some quick wins uh, and pass those to the other services for their use as well. Excellent. You're getting a lot of love. Lots of people are saying thank you on Facebook. Um, Julie read out the comments and it sounds like also lots of folks are interested in the Space Force. So where can our viewers go to learn more about it if they wanna get involved or possibly join? Yeah, if you want more information, uh, there's www.airforce.com slash Space Force or you can go to www.spaceforce.mil uh, uh, in either location. If you guys post that up on your site, uh, either of those locations will get you information about how to join, how to apply, uh, all of our latest stats, uh, just information on, on where we are uh, as we go now into year two. Um, as Chief says, 14 months. So you know, we're growing <laughs> still, we're crawling, we're crawling, but we're getting there. We're moving fast. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, ma'am, we, we could definitely could talk to you all day, but uh, I, we gotta we gotta wrap it up. So, uh, are there any parting words you wanna you wanna uh, say to our service members uh, out there watching us today and their families? I would just like to say to thank you to all of you for your service, uh, both you and your families. Uh, this is a team sport. Uh, we cannot do this alone. It takes all of us, every service, uh, to include the Space Force and Guardians together. Uh, working with soldiers, sailors, air marines, and coast guardsmen 
how, how do we fight and win our nation's war and to serve is uh, of the highest honor. And so I applaud all of you for your service. Thank you for what you do. Uh, again, the Space Force is here to be a partner with all of you. Uh, and I look forward uh, to the continued partnership across the board as we work to stand the Space Force up because we can't do that without our coalition, commercial uh, and other service services here uh, in the Department of Defense. So thanks for everybody. Chief, thanks, you for, thanks to you and AFES for this, uh, this broadcast and webcast. I think it helps people stay connected uh, and to see the human element and sides of this. And I'm glad to see AFES leading the way on that because we absolutely need it uh, in these stressful times. And so I appreciate you guys and all the great speakers that you brought together. I, I'm humbled by to be on this compared to some of the other folks you've had in the past, uh, but it's been a great opportunity. I just wanna say thank you. Semper Super. Oh, awesome, awesome. Man. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been a truly an honor to talk with you. Uh, like I said, we 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 kind of we, we were in this this booth at the uh, Armed Forces Bowl, and we were you know sharing stories about a bunch of different things. And I was like, "Ma'am, you got to be on the show." And so <laughs> we, I was able to take advantage of that opportunity to to get you on the show. And you were you were like, "No, absolutely." And so thank you so for being so flexible and and and, and you know eager to be on the show. So we are definitely appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for what you and thank you for you and your family for what you do for this great nation as well. Um, like I said, I'm I, I I like new stuff. So when it's the space force, I was really interested in how it's going to progress, and it and it has it's moved like like the speed of light, literally. Like you guys ch have changed so much <laughs> <laughs> from, from from the day mm -hmm. that it started to now. And uh, I, you know, I just want to see where it goes in the future. So thank you so much, and uh, Semper Supra. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Bye. man. Chief, chat out. Chat out. <laughs>